to airborne intelligence, space, air traffic control, and defense uh, mission systems. Among his accomplishments is his leadership in designing advanced airport surveillance systems, making air travel safer. He's a principal, he was a principal engineer, uh, uh, engineering fellow at Raytheon Company's Integrated Defense Systems in Sudbury. Dr. Bruckner has pay, played a key role in many ra major radar and phased array radar systems developed during the past 40 years. His teaching and lecturing have inspired and educated several generations of radar engineers worldwide, and over 10,000 have attended his lectures. Presumably he had, he had more than one lecture. <laughs> <laughs> he received his BSEE from the City College of the City of New York and his MEE and DRSC at Colum from Columbia University quite a few years ago. He's worked on ground, sea, air, and space radars at Raytheon from 1962 to 2014. He's written four popular books. These are top ten sellers. Right. That, that's right. Yeah, on radar, arrays, and tracking. Um, it made on the Reader's Digest, too. I think there's a Reader's Digest one. No? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Um, he's been a banquet. Working on it. Oh, you're working on it. Okay. He's been a banquet uh, keynote speaker 13 times. He has over 230 papers, talks, correspondences, and he's been invited to for over 100 of them, and he has 10 patents. I'm rather impressed. Mm -hmm. Eli. Thank you. <laughs> Does anybody want to hold the uh, computer while I talk? Uh, you want somebody to just flip the pages? Yeah, just push the buttons here. You want to stand in front of the projector? Yeah. I'll move around. See if I can just get the escape button. Get rid of that, and then your arrow keys are. Uh, this work? Yeah. Okay. Morning! <laughs> Wake up! <laughs> Play the mouse on radar and phase the rays. And Einstein's duality theory. I have a lot to cover. Yeah. Next. Uh, I give this, this is an important view graph. This is you before the talk. This is you after the talk. Next. That pointer does work with the screen. I, I oh, is that the problem? Oh, oh okay. okay. So I can put it away. <laughs> is there a physical pointer here somewhere? Is there a mechanical one? I would have brought mine. <laughs> uh, I get in other countries. Next. Next. China. Next. China, two languages. Next. Mm -hmm. I also give travel logs. Uh, next. Now the topic here is uh, radar. Radar is like a light, mm -hmm. invisible light. A flashlight. Next. It works with waves, like ocean waves. Next. Next. Surfing, waves, mm -hmm. next. And bats uh, use radar. They use sound for locating insects, next. In the caves, in the dark. Mm -hmm. The echo tells them where the insects are. And uh, the sound that we hear, music, uh, goes from 20 to 20,000 hertz for a second. Next. Now light is electromagnetic waves at very high frequency. The uh, blue light is 600 trillion cycles per second. That's uh, I'll, I'll indicate what that is uh, in a minute. And, uh, and then there's the uh, red light, which is a lower frequency, 460 trillion cycles per second. Next. And a trillion is a million, million cycles per second. Next. 
And then there's invisible light, oh, uh, which is radar. Mm -hmm. Typically, it goes big range of frequencies, but a typical one is a billion, billion, 10 to the 9 cycles per second. Next. And other invisible light is next. X-rays, which are a higher frequency than light. Next. Uh, infrared, which is lower frequency than light. Next. And there's gravity waves, which is very popular these days. Oh, it's a low, very low frequency. Next. Now, light, you have a flashlight. You have the bulb, which provides the light. And then the reflector, which acts like a lens to give you a collimated beam. Radar works the same way, different frequency. Next. It has the reflector, which is like a lens. And it has a horn, which is uh, feeding the light, which is invisible light, like a billion cycles per second. The form of a collimated beam, and here we see it. Uh, go back to that. Next, yeah. next, next. To see strange objects in space. Next. Mm -hmm. Now, we, and we have a light bulb that provides our visible light, 100 watt bulb. And a radar, the light bulb is, next, this big tube, about this high. Puts out a million watts, and the input is 100 watts. It's at uh, about 420 megahertz, uh, 10 feet high. Next, used in uh, Lincoln Lab radars. They use a, uh, a different tube for uh, identifying space objects. And they uh, get pictures of them. Next. Here's the space object. They upgraded the radar recently. It's called the Haystack. It used to be the picture that looks like this, but now it looks more like the real object. This is a one inch resolution. It can get down to one centimeter actually with super resolution techniques at 95 gigahertz. Next. Here shows that picture again. Uh, they're upgrading it to go to synchronous altitude, one inch resolution. Next. Radar can see uh, spiders. It's a tarantula. My, my friendly tarantula. Mm -hmm. Next. Uh, uh, moths. Next. The big one. Uh, monkeys uh, and Borneo. Next. And monkey skulls. That's not the same monkey. <laughs> Next. Now, I explain now how a phased array radar works. This is very important. It has uh, radiating elements here, n of them. They're all transmitting a microwave signal, an invisible light, billion cycles per second. That's one cycle. In synchronous. If you go out on the bore site far enough, these are all in phase here. So if you go out far enough, they add in phase. Next. Go out far enough, they equal path length to your uh, observation point. Next. And as a result, all N signals from the N radiating elements add up to one big signal at the observation point. Next. But as you go off bore site, that's no longer the case. There's a different path length, longer path length to the top than to the bottom. Next. As a result, next, this, the, the, the signals at some angle will be uniformly distributed about the unit circle to add up to what? Zero. Zero, right. Next. And it's th th this. There's an angle where that happens, that's where you get a null. Here's the intensity of the signal as you go off bore site. Bore site. And beyond, bore, beyond this null, you get side lobes. The angle where the null occurs is lambda, the wavelength, divided by the size of the antenna. 
lambda over L. And we'll show that. And the width of the beam, the 4 dB width of the beam, 4 dB down, it's roughly the half power point, is uh, lambda over L also, <coughs> the uniform illumination, equal half, equal strength. Next, uh, here's the equations. Uh, here is the frequency I'm assuming for the radar, a billion cycles per second, 10 to the ninth, uh, one, uh, 1 gigahertz. That's uh, what the Cobra Dane has for its uh, carrier frequency. The wavelength is given by the velocity of light divided by the frequency at uh, 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 1 gigahertz. This is roughly a foot. And that's shown uh, here, one foot. Next. Now what we'd like to do is scan the beam off course site. One way to do that is tilt the antenna. Can we get the beam? But we some of our radars are big, like a 10-story building, and it's hard to t move the building in microseconds. <laughs> Mechanical engineers haven't been able to do that, so we have to help them out. Next, what we do is we radiate the signal from the different elements at different phases. Radiate this one leading, then lagging by phi, two phi, three phi, all the way up to n minus one phi. The phase front now is tilted. You want to back up one? Back up, sorry. Like you had when you had the antenna tilted. Mm -hmm. As a result, go forward now. The beam now is pointed down as if the antenna was tilted. And that's the basics for uh, electronic scanning antenna. Now you know the basics for electric, electronic scanning. That's the fundamental. Next. Whoops. Next. Okay. What we're going to do now, back up one, go to that angle off course site where the signals are uniformly distributed around the unit circle, get the first no. I want to find out what, show what angle that is. Next. When we're off at that angle, here's course site, here's that angle where they're uniformly distributed around the unit circle. The signals here, this one will be at 360 and then they'll be from 360 down to zero. That's what we have for the signals. If this one's at 360, all the errors are, and this one, this one will be lagging by zero, right? Is that clear? They'll be uniformly distributed around the unit circle. What, ha what angle is that at? Well, if this one's lambda, that means one cycle, if it's one cycle, 360, that's lambda. Lambda over L is this angle. That's the angle at which the first null occurs. That's the angle at which the first null, which is also the 4 dB width of the beam when you have uniform illumination, which is a nice relationship. Next. Now, to do the phase shift, to scan the beam, we have to put in phase shifts to scan the beam. What we do is put in different length cables, except we don't need any cables longer than lambda, because uh, a phase shift of 370 degrees is the same as what? 10 degrees. Everything is modulo 360. So only need one foot, a uh, cable that goes up to one foot. If you had a trombone cable, that would do it. You go from zero to one foot and just vary. That would give you phase shifts from zero to 360. And we do that next by switching in different lengths. 
Here's the input, this is the output. You put it in zero phase and you get your phase shift to signal at the output. If you go to this path, that's your reference, that's the zero. If you go this path, this path is longer than that one by lambda over eight, which is 45 degrees. So you get a, when you go this way, you get 45 degree phase shift versus going that way. This one is longer by lambda over four. That's 90 degrees. So going this way, you get 90 degrees, this versus that. And here it's lambda over two longer, which is 180 degrees. And by switching in these different lengths at different times, you can go from zero to 360 in steps of 45 degrees. And that's the way it works. And 45 degree steps seems like it's too big. But it turns out that only 0.2 dB loss in signal strength, which is very small. Coberdain has a three bit, this is called a three bit phase shifter. It's two to the third, two to the third. Are, are it, those cables built into that thing that you It's actually a uh, strip line. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's etched, you know, it's, it's flat. Right. And, and they, have diodes, they have diodes here and here. You showed us that unit that was about six feet tall. Right, oh, that was the tube. This is, this is, this is, this is small. Right. It's small. Mm -hmm. It's not low power. It has to handle a, a thousand watt. Next. Uh, this gives the relationship between the phase shift you need and the angle you want to scan. And uh, it'll be in the uh, presentation. You can, it's very easy to drive. Okay. Next. Now, the important thing in a phase array is the spacing between the elements. If you make the elements too wide apart, it turns out not only will you get a beam in this case, on boresight, if you have zero phase shifts, you get beams at other angles, which means you get double vision, triple vision, quadruple vision, quintuple vision, <laughs> and that you don't want. <laughs> in order to avoid that, the spacing between the elements typically has to be lambda over two, roughly lambda over two. And that for one gigahertz, that's a foot. And so it's a half foot between elements. Uh, and you see that this is a problem. If I make this lambda, the spacing here, <coughs> signal on bore side will add up in phase because they you know, equal signals to the two elements. Signal coming from the right as it with zero phase here, it gets a lag of 360 degrees because it's lambda spacing. But lambda of 360 is the same as zero. So these two signals will add up. So you'll get a, a main beam to the right. You'll also get a main beam to the left. So you get triple vision. You don't want triple vision. If I made this twice as big, you'll get quadruple vision. You also get at 30, plus or minus 30 degrees main beams, five main beams. One here, one here, one here, one here. So uh, typically, like the lambda over two is the spacing between the elements. Next. Now the Coberdain, I like to use as an example, explain a big phase array or any phase array. Coberdain, I worked on it. Next. Picture I took of the Cobra Dane. Next. Another picture I took of the Cobra Dane standing in front of it. They told me it was off, but it felt mighty warm. <laughs> it's a big antenna. It's like a 10-story building from the bottom all the way up to the top. 95 feet diameter. 95 feet. Next. Oh, by the way, back up once. These circles are the radiating elements. They're the radiating elements. Circular waveguide. Mm -hmm. Circular waveguide. Next. Was that on six-inch centers? 
What's the question? Was that six inches? Are they six inches apart? Uh, roughly, uh, yeah. Roughly six inches apart. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, here's Boston. That's where we are. The U.S. Alaska. Anchorage. The Elysian Islands. You go out to the next to the last island, around 2,000 miles out from Anchorage. That's where the radar is. The reason it's put there is to monitor the Russian test firings of their ballistic missiles. It was agreed to with the Russians that we'd be put there to see that they abided by the SALT-1 negotiations. Next. Here again is the Aleutian Islands. Next. And here's the island on which the radar's on. It's about a mile wide and uh, two and a half miles long. And here's the runway, runs almost the length of the island. And the radar is up here somewhere. Next. Here's the radar. And it's used to, uh, besides looking at the Russian uh, missiles, test firing, uh, monitor uh, space objects. Space object. Next. Here's the Russian missile. Next. It actually measures the size of the missile. That's part of the negotiation. And the number. To do the measurement of the size of the missile, it transmits a very short pulse, which is five nanoseconds wide. And you get the echo from the tip and the echo from the back, and you measure the time between them. That gives you the size of the reentry vehicle. Uh, the bandwidth is 200 megahertz, uh, 5 nanoseconds, 5 nanosecond pulse. Next. And here we see that. Here's the uh, antenna, 95 feet. And we're looking off to the missiles. And here's the pulse coming out of the bottom and out of the top. And you notice that the one coming out of the bottom is delayed relative to the one, you know, it takes longer because it has a longer path length, right? Because it's going, looking up. As a result, these two pulses those two pulses don't arrive at the target at the same time. And in you have pulses in between, also from all the other elements, and you get a mess like this. You don't get, you, went, you want a five nanosecond pulse, right? To get a five nanosecond pulse, what you'd have to do at the target is make the antenna smaller. 95 feet is too big, five foot. If it's five foot, then the difference, this would only be about two feet. And that's, we can live with that. But that wouldn't be good because you'd have to increase the uh, power from the radar a factor of 10,000. Don't want to do that. What do we do next? We break the antenna up into small little antennas so we can use our three bit phase shifter for the small antenna. But when adding from the top to the bottom these little antennas, we use time delay steering. So we actually put in time delay so that the two signals go back a couple. Oh, back one, 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 one ahead, one ahead, ahead, ahead. Go forward, 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 forward. Yeah. If I, if I, uh, I delay this signal until, wait until this signal goes here, then, then transmit this one. Then these two arrive at the same time, and that's what's done. You put in delay from little antenna to little antenna. That's called uh, summary time delay steering, as opposed to phase array, where you have the three bit phase shifter. Next. Next. And behind each of those little antennas, go back one. Behind each of these little antennas is a microwave tube. Next. 
That's the picture of the tube. It's a traveling wave tube. 160 kilowatts peak, 10 kilowatts average. Next. It's, oh, by the way, next. Back, go back. Back, 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 back. It's a traveling wave tube. It has a surfboard and view graphs here. It's going out to the west coast. Uh, Next. Uh, you generate your waveform, you divide it up into 96, for 96 subarrays. You go through your time delay steering, your traveling wave tubes, 96 of them, into your subarrays, divided 160, uh, divided again, uh, the, each. So each uh, element is uh, supplied with one kilowatt peak power. Next. I mentioned that we have a 5 nanosecond pulse. The radar doesn't actually physically transmit a 5 nanosecond pulse. If we transmit a 5 nanosecond pulse, the peak power would have to be 3 trillion watts. If you put 3 trillion watts through that antenna, next. All the elements would be welded together, <laughs> and you have to have another radar to transmit your second pulse. <laughs> Next. So you'd have to have a lineup of radars. <laughs> the customer didn't like this. The $50 million a whack, you know. So we had to figure out something else. What we do is back up to, we transmit a low power, fit roughly 16 megawatts, long pulse, a millisecond. It has the same energy. And in the receiver, we compress it to a 5 nanosecond pulse. So that's the way it works. That's called pulse compression. Next. And here is that. Next, yeah. Now, I'd like to give you a tour of the radar. You, you get tours, tours, right? Uh, this is a radar tour. You, you, oh, you can't get this tour. You know, you can't go to Shemya, where this island is, uh, where this island, unless you have official business. Official business. So I, I, I had the privilege of going there. Next. Here's my first view of the radar. <laughs> I remember driving up the. It's on a hill. And the guy from Raytheon, he says, ah, this is the way it always looks here. I can't wait until I get out of here in two weeks. He had the wrong job. He was supposed to encourage you to come and stay. <laughs> Next, here's the view on a better day. You can see the top. That's the way it was for the first week and a half I was there. On the first Sunday, we had off on Sunday. The first Sunday I worked, I felt like working. But the second Sunday I was there, I was off, and the sun came out. Next. And they had a big announcement at the radar. The sun's out. <laughs> Here's the radar. Here's the radar it's replacing back here. Next. That's the same day mm. on the other side of the island. There's the radar. It's up on a 250 feet up, looking towards Russia. Next. Uh, here's the ground floor. 42,000 volt power supplies. I look, uh, 12 of them. 12 of them on the ground floor. Next. First floor. That's the modulator. There's a modulator bank. 12 of them, one for each power supply. Each one servicing eight TWTs. They're up here. The bottoms of the eight TWTs per modulator. Eight times twelve and ninety-six altogether. Next. If the outputs of the TWTs is three inch coax. The 160 kilowatts peak, 10 kilowatts average at one gigahertz. Next. Oh, by the way, before you next back. 
the tubes are under here. When this lifts up, and they have a, a crane to lift up the tube to replace it. Next. And here's the output going to one submarine of the 96 with 160 kilowatts 10, uh, peak, 10 kilowatts average, divided up into 160 three bit phase shifters. Those three bit phase shifters are here. I carried a little bag of them to replace some that burnt out. Uh, uh, Maycom provided the uh, uh, phase shifters. Next. Just looking down the center of the array, there are 10 subarrays here being fed with 10 of these 3 inch coax. Next. And here's the top, the top floor, which is short cord. There are only four subarrays uh, versus the 10 through the center. And here's computer paper because the computer is on the other side of the wall here. Next. And here, they're hosing down the front of the face of the array. The reason for that is in case of a fire. I have proof that we can put out the fire. The hoses go to the top, you see. So this is proof that we passed the test. Next. We're avoiding this problem. This is a picture of the first large phased array built in the U.S. burning down <laughs> before the acceptance tests were complete. <laughs> they call it a get well fire, you know. <laughs> it cost them as much to re replace it after the fire. Uh, next. Here's Dale Reese pointing out the leak that resulted from the washing, hosing down the array. He built the beam steering computer. Uh, he became the head of the uh, program and actually became a VP. Very smart young fellow. Next. And here, the next day, they're plugging up the leaks. And here's the radiating elements in a triangular lattice. Next. The elements are put like that versus this. When you put them in this arrangement, you don't need as many elements to avoid double vision, what I called double vision before. It minimizes the number of elements by a factor of 15% versus doing it this way. Next. And if you look in the retina of an insect, which is the same as in the, US, in the human being, these are the elements in your eye. They're lambda over two apart in a triangular lattice. So nature knew. It's amazing, you know. Next. And for insects, the eyes are also in an isosceles, you know, a 60 degree triangle. Next. Same here. Next. Uh, these uh, pictures came to me from a fellow who studied uh, insects' eyes for his master's degree at MIT. He applied for a job at, MI, at Raytheon. He knew nothing about radar. <laughs> but we hired him because we figured he'd learn very fast. He was smart. He became a very good engineer. Uh, here is the uh, day after the washing. It's the last day I was at Shemya. Not a cloud in the sky. The only day like this. A beautiful day. Next. Is looking down on the platform. Next. Right, here I am lecturing on the radar, inside the radar, inside the radar, ground floor. I had more hair then, you know. <laughs> yeah, next. Here I'm turning on the high power in the radar. Next, all the 96 students. Next. Here I'm operating the cyber compu computer. Uh, it's a PDP-11, actually. That's me over there. I did everything. Next. Uh, there's two of the fellows there. Here's the display. It shows Kinchat, Russia. Uh, 
uh, and targets being tracked. This fellow would go up on the radar up and operate it all by himself. Next. And that's looking up on the radar, uh, front of the face. Next. Uh, the radar can see a grapefruit at a thousand miles. You have to coat it with silver. <laughs> Next. <laughs> there it is again. It's a tube radar. Next. Tube. Next. That represents the first generation of phase arrays. The first. We'll cover in the next generations. Next. But I'd like to uh, digress for a minute. I served on a committee for arms control at MIT, arms control, to show I was uh, asked to uh, lecture on the use of radars like the Cobradine to do arms control, which was its purpose. And it resulted in a book. Uh, this is the book. Next. I wrote this chapter. Next. Some of the authors. Next. Next. And here are some of the people at the conference. I didn't realize the, how distinguished these people were. Yeah. Uh, he was once president. Uh, that's Jerry Wiesner, president of MIT. He was also uh, President Kennedy's science advisor. He was the head of the CIA. He was deputy head of the CIA. I couldn't find a picture of him. He didn't want his face sat in the public. It turns out he died in very suspicious circumstances. So he kept it. Uh, he headed up the Pacific Fleet. And this fellow was in, uh, the uh, fellow who designed the H bomb under Teller. Teller assigned him. Mm. At the age of 24, got his PhD at the age of 18. 21, 21, 21. T uh, Fermi called him the only genius he ever met. And then there was me there, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Next. This is a, the tale, the suspicious uh, death of that CIA fellow. Next. Uh, he also uh, involved with the Cooley Tubi algorithm. He pointed out where you find the Cooley Tubi algorithm. Next. And here's where we met. <laughs> wow. There's only 30 members on, uh, at the conference. Very distinguished, though. At MIT, one of the old classrooms. Next. I also uh, attended another conference like this, uh, resulted in a book uh, a couple of years later. Next. Next. I'd like to give a little bit of history while I'm at it. Next. What did we do in World War I for radar? We did have radar in World War I, believe it or not. Next. <laughs> Acoustic. <laughs> passive. Wow. It gives you asthma for information, you know. Next. Asthma. Asthma. Next. It gives you ASL. Mm -hmm. Next. As. Next. As. Next. Phase array. Looks like a trombone, man. Next. What about World War II? Okay. Next. We had triads and tetros. They didn't produce much in the way of microwaves. 100 watts, something like that. Next. Along came the magnetron, the British invention, mm -hmm. uh, among others. Next, they were looking for some way to manufacture it at high speed because it took them a long time to, they were doing milling, they milled them out of a hot, solid piece of copper. Next, uh, Vannevar Bush was uh, the science advisor for uh, President Roosevelt. He advised them to go see the people at Raytheon. Uh, and see what they can do. And uh, he was the uh, CEO, founder of the company, and he was their chief scientist. Uh, I think he only had a high school degree, if that. Next. And he, he solved the problem. He figured out how to increase the speed of production a factor of a thousand. A thousand. 
Next. The way he saw what he said is the sheets of copper stamp them out and then solder them together. Mm -hmm. And he increased the speed of a factor of a thousand. <laughs> Next. He used to take, uh, he used to do two, de two a day, but with the uh, stamping, it's uh, 2,000 a day. Next. Uh, you know what they do now if you want to make a, a magnetron? You mill them out. <laughs> Timing is very important. <laughs> because they have high speed milling machines now. Computer control. Next. Uh, and uh, only $7 a magnetron. They're being replaced though by transistors. Eventually they'll have transistors instead of magnetrons. Next. Uh, while we're at it, uh, Raytheon was involved with the uh, first uh, U.S. Navy shipboard radar, the uh, SG, which led to the S0 to S13. Uh, there were 6,000 of these built, and uh, many of them on the uh, PT boats, among which uh, President Kennedy was on. Mm -hmm. Next. Uh, MIT did the uh, landing radars. Next. Uh, Raytheon did the uh, tubes for the fuse, uh, the super secret uh, proximity fuse. Could withstand 20,000 G. 20,000 G. He's an MIT graduate, by the way. Worked at Raytheon. Next. Uh, that fellow who uh, solved the problem of the magnetron also invented the microwave oven. Next. And the me of next. Uh, we covered that next. Uh, and radar can look up for strange objects in space, as I showed, mentioned next. Uh, with a dish in some cases, and a fan beam in other cases. Next is a fa old fan beam radar. One horsepower. <laughs> I went to South Korea and I saw some very advanced fan beam radars. Next. <clears throat> one fan beam. Next. Two fan beams, one rotation, you get two updates. Next. A large number of fan beams doesn't have to rotate. It's a phase array fan beam. Yeah, phase array fan. Next. Uh, Here's an actual phased array of fire control at S band. That's the 3,000 megahertz. Mm -hmm. Three by 14 elements. Next, here it shows the size of the thing. Next. Uh, now, since World War II. Next. Many pie in the sky ideas never went anywhere. Next. People put on their rose colored glasses. Next. <laughs> Next. But phased arrays have seen amazing advances uh, during my career. Mm -hmm. Next. Especially multifunction phase arrays. And the Cobra Dane is such a radar. Next. Here's a multifunction phase array. You know, head of air, head of ground, tail warning. You see the tail warning? Mm -hmm. It's a flader mouse. Next. Cobra Dane. Next. There's that Cobra Dane. Next. That's the first generation phase arrays. Two. Two. Next. Two. Next. Here's a block diagram. First generation. You have a big tube. Goes to your array with phase shifters. No amplifiers. No generation of uh, microwave power. And then I receive a low noise amplifier. None at the uh, array. Next. Here's some examples of uh, first generation phase arrays. Next. Other examples, next. Second generation phase arrays. Transistor transmitters replace the tubes. Transistors replacing the tubes. Next. No tubes. Next. Transistors for the transmitters. Next. Here's the transistors. 
It's actually a bunch of transistors in one package combined with uh, wiring. Wiring. Next. And such a radar is the pay pause. That's important radar here. Uh, it's actually in Cape Cod. Cape Cod. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't have to go to Shembia. <laughs> Uh, two hour drive, I get there. Next, I went there on a Sunday, mm -hmm. took this picture. It has two faces. Two faces. Slightly bigger in height than the Cobra Dane. Next, 102 feet across. Plus, uh, uh, 120, uh, 120 degree coverage here, 120 degree there. Mm. Looking out over the Atlantic. Mm. Next. For launching of Russian submarines, uh, missiles. That's the purpose. Next. And also for monitoring space objects. Next. It's not a tube radar. Next. Instead, here's your array. And every element, you have a power amplifier with transistors. Not tubes. And a low noise apple bar at every element. And your face shifter right here. This is called a transceiver or a TR module. And there's one at every element for the second generation K3s. Second generation. Next. Here's the TR module. It's about that big. That's it. Next. Yes, looking through the middle of the array. Next. This is looking through the middle of the Cobra Dane tube array. Go back one. Yes, looking through the middle of the Pave Post Solid State array. Notice the big difference. This is empty. The only thing you see here is the power supply, 28 volts for the, for the TR modules. Practically nothing there. The TR modules plug right into the back of the array here, so you don't see them except for subarray TR modules. Otherwise, it's pretty empty space. <laughs> it looks like it wasn't built. I said, gee, it looks like I'm not finished yet. <laughs> I'm used to the other pictures. Show up next. I'm used to this. <laughs> next. And here's looking up the face of the array. Again, it felt kind of warm. They told me it wasn't operating. <laughs> it's Bennett Dipole, next. Uh, they made that to cover a Scientific America a paper I wrote. Uh, uh, I meant to bring a few copies, I can bring them next time. Uh, it goes through uh, how phase arrays work, including the Coverdain and the uh, A course. Next. The dipoles are bent. Uh, that's to reduce the coupling between elements, so you don't have as much backscatter power not re reflected back into the radar. Next, if the power is reflected back into the radar, you get this. You know, you got a million watts going back in, it burn up the radar. As a matter of fact, I was told that was the cause of this uh, fire, that it was a poor design. Turns out it wasn't that problem. It was a sh simple short. <laughs> uh, next. Here's some other second generation phase arrays. Next, solid state transistor. We now come to the third generation. The third generation is also transistors, except now it's using integrated circuits. Next. For the hardware in the TR module. Next, it gets rid of all these bonded wires. It's using integrated circuits like you have in your PC, integrated circuits. Next, and here's some examples of that, of our third generation phase arrays. Next, next. Uh, I, I was in at the beginning of this, uh, I, I went to DARPA to seek funding for Raytheon, uh, competitive funding. And uh, we managed to get two contracts for, uh, for, for funding 
to support the development of this third generation of phaser aids. We never knew how successful it would be. It warms my heart to see all these UGRAFs with uh, the success that was achieved with the third generation of phaser arrays, integrated circuit phaser arrays. This is for airborne radars. Uh, this one in particular, done by Raytheon on the West Coast, a uh, paper presented by a fellow in charge from the government, a pilot. He said the phaser array only cost 25% more than the mechanical one that they replaced. I, I'm very impressed. Mm -hmm. It gave you much more capability. Next. Here's our, the Europeans are getting third generation. Next. The Russians finally also. Next. Uh, here's a... Uh, replaces the rotodome on the top of the AWACS. Uh, it's a Westinghouse radar. Next. For Australia. Here's a... Uh, 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 here. <coughs> A blimp, uh, 10,000 feet up, protecting uh, Washington, D.C. Look down, radar. Next. Here's a replacement for uh, a first generation radar on the Aegis ships that uh, Raytheon's building, these uh, radars. Uh, third generation phaser is. Next. A stealth ship. Low cross section. Low cross section. Next. Looks small, but it's actually very big. Next. Here you can see how big it is. Many stories high in the construction. Next. Here's the day of the dedication. It's on, up in Maine, Bathworks. Next. Next. Here's the uh, in dock. Here's the gangplank. Next. Uh, this is a radar for ballistic missile defense. 42,000 TR modules, third generation, phaser eight. Uh, antenna is 72 feet in diameter at X band. At X -band. I call it the third <coughs> wonder of the world. You know, there's seven winners in the world. This is the, the eighth, rather, the eighth. This is the eighth. Next. The Patriot. Now, the Patriot started, when I started at Raytheon, they, they had the proposals lined up down the aisles, I remember. Uh, Raytheon put up its own money. They lost the competition to RCA. But they invested their own money for the development of the first prototype uh, uh, design. And uh, there it is. Over 200 have been built around the world. It's seen an upgrade though. This shows you that you can upgrade an old radar it's now a 2015 state-of-the-art radar. Originally replaced the back end, all the tubes, of the receiver and transmit. And then finally the transmit antenna and its transmit tubes with uh, solid state third generation uh, hardware. Using GAN, as a matter of fact. So, uh, Army plans to use it to 2046. That's state of the art now. Next. We did uh, work for space also. Uh, this is a communication uh, for tele uh, telephone, uh, like your cell phone, uh, called Iridium. Next. Here's the Iridium. Raytheon built the antennas for that. It's an L band. Uh, 1.6 gigahertz for, for next through satellites. Here's the satellite phone. Next. Here's one of the satellites. Uh, they have it hanging in the Smithsonian. If you go to the Smithsonian, <laughs> if they need another satellite, they know where to go. <laughs> next. 
Uh, recently, they used this to launch replacements. Next. This is the uh, SpaceX Falcon uh, from uh, Elon Musk. Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. Next. Mm -hmm. Next. Uh, here's the launching. Next. Uh, they have a new generation of uh, radio. And uh, I also worked on uh, this one. This is the uh, radar set. It was a tube, now it's a solid state. Uh, and uh, I suggested they do it this way, and that's the way they went to JPL. Next. Uh, the iridium we could I could have used when I was in Papua New Guinea. That's an island north of uh, Australia. Next. I went there in 1992. Here's Australia. Here's New Guinea. Next. They don't have uh, good highways there. It's, you got around by boat. Uh, here I am with the local thing through my nose. Oh. <laughs> Next. You know what that is through his nose? It's a dipole antenna! <laughs> <laughs> they have to operate at low frequency for their iridium system, for you know, voice communication. They have to go through the rainforest, so they need to operate at VHF. And that's the dipole there. So a very advanced system they have. Next. Next. Uh, I also worked uh, back in the 90, late 90s on a teledesic, which was uh, a satellite system for high speed uh, internet using satellites. The Iridium people didn't like us working on Teledesic, so they offered to have us work on their system. And so I worked on their system. And I told them uh, they were too ambitious. They have to go and relook the design of their system because the uh, specs they were putting on the antenna, I said, were too difficult to make a low cost system. It would not be competitive. What they immediately did is threw me off the job. <laughs> they said, Eli Bruckner is not optimistic enough. Mm -hmm. So they threw me off. How did it come out? <laughs> I was right. It never went. It, it, yeah. Too difficult. Mm -hmm. But now, Elon Musk is launching it's a 12 satellite system, 12,000 satellites. Yeah. Uh, and he launched a few, quite a few already. Hmm. Next. Yeah, here's what he launched. Uh, 60 from one launch, 60. Mm -hmm. But he plans to launch 12,000. Mm -hmm. That's big time, big time. Mm -hmm. He's not the only one, though. Next. Uh, he also launched a car up there, you know, one of his cars. Oh. That's in preparation going to Mars. <laughs> That's the car there, and there's the astronaut there. Mm -hmm. Next. We now come to the fourth generation. Mm -hmm. Digital beam forming. Next. Here's the uh, previous generations. We have the array, we have our phase shifters. If you want to form two beams, we have two sets of phase shifters and two sets of combiners. Mm -hmm. All hardware, done by hardware. The fourth generation, next. We just have eight of these here, a computer here. And we have as many beams as our computer can handle. Mm -hmm. As things advance, we can have more powerful computers, we can have more beams. And we do more. That's the fourth generation. And a lot of work has been done in this direction now. And that's the direction for the future, fourth generation. Next. 
here's some examples of fourth generation uh, radars. Next. Including the uh, air and missile defense radar I showed from Raytheon. It does it at the submarine level. Next. Uh, in my travels, I did come across uh, digital beam forming radars, which generate multiple beams. They are capable of generating multiple beams. Next. Is a three beam system <laughs> in Borneo. Next. Multiple beam. I didn't like him. I was eating on the top and he was on the bottom of my bungalow. Next. Uh, Handle missing elements with digital beam form. Next. Correct for bad elements. Next. Uh, the future is having digital beam forming done at the element level. That's the goal. Next. And that's, the, when you do that, you can have your array here. One part of it for radar, another part for COM, another part for EW. You want to change the mix, you need more capability for COM. Bigger portion for COM, less for radar, and about the same for EW. Mm -hmm. That's if you have the uh, digital beam forming at the element level. Mm -hmm. Next. And there are a number of radars doing it on receive at the element level. This is from ELTA, an uh, uh, Israeli company. Four-phase phase array at S-band, around three gigahertz carrier frequency, at the element level. Next. Australia, six-phase S-band at the element level. Has undergone sea trials already. Next. The French have a thousand element one at S-band. Next. Uh, Lockheed Martin for the space fence. This is very impressive. They have 86,000 elements on receive, dual polarized, which means they have 100, 172,000 A to D's on receive mm -hmm. for 182,000 channels. Being built at Kwajalein uh, radar for monitoring space objects, debris and uh, satellites. Next. Uh, not to be outdone, Raytheon is working on a reconfigurable A to D where you can have the radar operate either at X band or S band on demand and switch in microseconds either way with a 400 megahertz bandwidth, instantaneous. Next. One advantage of digital beam forming, in addition to the ability to have multiple beams and multi-modes, is it reduces uh, the power you need to do your search. Next. Let me explain that. In a conventional radar, earlier generation radars, you transmit the beam and you receive a beam at the same shape at the same location. And then you do the next and the next so you have a fence. One way the beam is 3 dB down, two way it's 6 dB down because you have to receive and transmit. If you have digital beam forming available, you don't need hardware to generate an additional beam. It's just software and computer power, and that's getting inexpensive. What you're able to do is put many receive beams here. So instead of being 6 dB down here, you'll have a beam which is peaked here, and it's only 3 dB down. And you can go out further to square root 2 further here. We get 6 dB down one way and you 0 dB on receive. So you, you need fewer beams to do your search fence. Square root 2 fewer. In two dimensions, you only need a factor of 2 fewer beams. 
which is almost a factor of two saving in power and in time to do the task. A big advantage of digital bean farming. You don't need hardware. Hardware is expensive. Signal processing is getting very inexpensive. Next. Here's the 2D factor of two almost uh, advantage in search. You also have the advantage that you can locate where the target is in search much more accurately with the many received beams. Next. Next, I already said that. Another advantage of uh, digital beam farming, it allows you to do what I call adaptive array processing which I more recently call Cognitive Adaptive Array Processing. Why did I change the name to Cognitive? That's the in word these days. If you have Cognitive in your paper, you get it accepted. Uh, adaptive, it doesn't buy you anything. Next, and I have a patent on this. It's, well, it was originally Adaptive. Back in 88. Next which I now call it cognitive. Next. Okay. What does it involve? It involves making use of all the information you have available. It's a very simple idea. But it's, a lot of times we don't make use of all the information that's available. And here I show that to be the case. Don't put on your blinders. Next. Assume we have to cope with a jammer. A noisy jammer, call that a barrage jammer. Next. We want to cancel it out. Next. Assume initially one jammer. Next. What we do, we'll assume a linear rate, n elements. What we do is form n beams. With an n element array, you can form n beams to cover all angles, plus or minus 90 <coughs> degrees. One way to do that is to use the fast Fourier transform. To go from here to here is a fast Fourier transform. Uh, uh, for those who are familiar with fast Fourier transforms or signal processing, think of this as time. It's really distance along the aperture. And this would be frequency. And here it's angle, angle. So distance and angle replaces time and frequency. But otherwise, it's the same math, same math. Fast Fourier transform, or Fourier transform. Next. What you do now is you look at the outputs. Assume you have one jammer. You look at the outputs, and you see which one has a large output. That's the jammer. So it's easy to locate the jammer, right? Next. Let's assume uh, we're looking for a target with the beam pointing on Borsite, and there's a jammer at this side lobe here. What we do is we have this beam here, which is in which that uh, jammer is located. We adjust the gain and phase of that beam such that the signal in that beam from the jammer is the same amplitude and phase as in the main channel. Mm -hmm. We then subtract the one from the beam looking at the jammer from the main channel. And what does it do to this to jammer? It gets rid of it. You subtract, you get rid of it. It's equivalent to putting a null in the antenna pattern here. Next. You see there's a null here. And you get a slight degradation of the adjacent side load by 2 dB higher. So it's a very simple way of getting rid of the jammer. It only requires four training samples and uh, five div divides. Now, the classical way of doing this, next, when you don't make use of all the information, this makes use of knowing where the jammer is. Is uh, you, you get weights here across the array and on the array using this matrix computation here. Mm -hmm. 
which assumes you don't know where the jammer is. Doing it this way forms a beam pointing at the, at the target, where you're looking for the target, and puts nulls where the jammers are. One jammer, you have one null. But the computation is very uh, difficult here, and the number of training samples you need is very difficult. Uh, large. Uh, it involves a matrix here for a 10,000 element array. The matrix is 10,000 elements by, by 10,000 elements, which requires to estimate that measure. You don't know what it is, so you have to estimate it. It requires 50,000 training samples, whereas the cognitive weight only requires four training samples. So a big advantage in that respect. And also, uh, the computation is much larger in doing the matrix inversion of this 10,000 by 10,000 element array. Uh, it involves uh, 100 billion times more operations than if you use the cognitive approach. 100 billion times more operations. Complex. Next. It also gives you poor side loads. You get a nice know with jammer is. But your side loads are degraded up to 30 dB in many places. Before, next, for the cognitive way, you only got two side loads that are degraded. Here, you got all these side loads. Not nice. Next. Here I show a table comparing the two. The number of training samples with the cognitive, only four. With the classical way, it's 50,000 for a 10,000 element array. This is a 10,000 element array. And uh, here you need an inverse of a 10,000 by 10,000 element uh, array. Here you don't need one. Big difference. Next. Uh, if you have J jammers, the similar idea, you locate the jammers and you point beams at them uh, and use that to uh, Cancel out the jammers in the uh, ch ch uh, where you're looking for the target. Next. Next. Yeah. Next. Let me throw in a travel slide. <laughs> uh, we had a radar conference in Rome, Italy. Rome, Italy. What I found was that people who weren't radar engineers before became radar engineers. <laughs> Uh, uh, next, went to Venice. Conference was in uh, Rome. Next, the church there. Next, mm -hmm. it's inside the church. Next, mm -hmm. I was waiting outside the church. Next, my son. Next, the birds are very tame there. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is in China a Venice of the Far East, next. And you paddle up the river there, next. Mm -hmm. She's singing while she's working, next. Now, going back to the topic at hand. Uh, what makes digital beam forming possible? Moore's law, Moore's law, Moore's law, Moore's law. What is Moore's law? Next. It's the doubling of the number of transistors per unit area every two years. It's been going on for 50 years. Next. Uh, they say it's dead, but actually they expect it to increase by a factor of 50, the density in the next 30 years, which is not a small amount. Next. And the power to be reduced per transistor by a factor of 75. Next. Uh, that was the status a couple of years ago. Next. Uh, here's the history. Next. Now, in my career, when I was in uh, high school and college, high school, mm -hmm. I worked with tubes, vacuum tubes. Mm -hmm. 
two by two by uh, two by one by one inch. Next. I, I now <laughs> I carry around a memory stick, uh, this memory stick, 128 gigabytes. If I use tubes to do this job, it would be 128 billion tubes. A dollar or two, that would be $128 billion. It cost me 35 bucks. And the power is not using any power at all right now. But if I use tubes at one watt per two, it would be 130 gigawatts, which would be 130 nuclear power plants. And if I stack the tubes, one on top of the other, sideways, they go nine times the distance to the moon. <laughs> I wouldn't need to launch, you know, I just climb up the stack. <laughs> yeah. That's your space ladder. Space right, right. Elevator, right? My elevator. Next. Next. Uh, some of you remember the uh, cyber CDC, the CDC 7600s, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the iPhone, which looks like this, is a hundred times faster than that supercomputer was, which was the fastest at its time. It has 10 million times the memory and costs 150,000 as much. <laughs> That's amazing, really amazing. Next. Uh, you know, I used to work at Raytheon. And one of the employees beat Raytheon. And when you beat Raytheon, you have to brag about it. So here we go. Beat Einstein. Next. Here's the cover of the Microwave Journal. It has famous scientists here, you know, Armstrong. Uh, Galar, uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, he includes uh, Bill Gates and Zuckerberg. And here's Einstein over here. There he is. And stuck in the corner here is me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you look under the sea here, that's me again! <laughs> <laughs> Next. So I occurred twice. Einstein only occurred once. <laughs> and all these other guys, once. I beat them all. <laughs> Next. There. Next. I also occurred, uh, was on the cover of the IEEE AESS magazine, dancing. Einstein never occurred. Anymore. Next. That's me dancing with uh, Sarah Palin. <laughs> I'm dancing with the stars. <laughs> Next. Here I am in the back cover of the AES magazine uh, for a radar conference in India, in India, 2008, uh, with a radar engineer, Dr. Uh, Anna, doing a waltz. Next. Here we are. Next, I also appeared on the, the Chronicle TV show three times. Mm -hmm. Einstein never appeared. Next. <laughs> Next. <laughs> okay. What about microwaves? Integrated circuits for microwaves. Mm -hmm. Not as uh, advanced as uh, for digital, but they're getting there. Next. I call it extreme mimic. Next. 
Uh, here's a little chip. It's a radar. All the microwaves search free for a radar on a chip. That's pretty impressive. Next. Here's the circuitry. Next. Another radar. Here's the circuitry. Next. Right here. Next. Uh, here's a Raytheon uh, phase array uh, on a little board. On a little board. That's seven beams. Seven beams. For blind spot. Raytheon built 200, 2 million of these. So, next. Uh, in the future, uh, low cost because of uh, millimeter wave push it for 5G. Next. Uh, also, uh, there's uh, going to be a law that uh, in 2022 that all cars are going to have to have automatic braking, which means every car is going to have to have a radar for automatic braking in 2022 in the U.S. Next. So everybody's going to have a car a radar. Uh, you have these uh, radars in your airport to do your search. Next. Uh, here's your 5G. Next. Uh, future, these only cost a few dollars, the car radars. Next. Uh, here's a chip, small chip. It has the circuitry for a, uh, a 32 element array at 60 gigahertz, all in one little chip. Intel, Intel. Next. Here's a bigger chip, here's a quarter chip. Uh, 256 elements at 60 gigahertz. Next. There's the beams that it generates. Next. Uh, typically have uh, over 100 uh, RF transistors on the chip. Next. Uh, here's such an array that's commercially available for 5G. Uh, 64 elements at 30 gigahertz by a Nokia, no, a Nokia wave uh, loca uh, located in uh, Bell Ricker, a uh, local company. Next, here's me holding that uh, array here. That's it, right here. At the Heinz Auditorium a couple of years ago. Next. Uh, feature, these only cost a few dollars. Next. And they be in your cell phones. Next. Going from satellite to your cell phone. Your iPhone, your Google Glasses. Next. Well, I showed you these big radars. Next. Next. I want to show you a small radar. Next. There's a watch, and the radar is right here. It's a smart watch. That's a small radar. Next, here it is again. Next, that's a Google Google uh, part of this. So they're getting to where Dick Tracy was when I was a kid. Wristwatch. Next, uh, you can buy a radar. You know, go in your sports store, sixty dollars, eighty dollars, eighty dollars. Next, uh, speed gun on eBay. You can get still uh, a toy one. Uh, for twenty dollars, at least that's when I last looked. Next, well, you can build one like a DC HIF. There's some companies that sell these. A coffee can radar. Lincoln Lab did the design of the antenna. Where you plug it in. You know. Next, Maxwell House uh, coffee can. Uh, Costs will go down. You be able to print your RF circuits, your micro circuits. Next, uh, use for clothing. Be a big push. Next. Uh, get rid of these antenna on your cell phone. You don't see those anymore. Next. There's no no phone, no, no antenna. The case becomes the antenna. And all I have is a little chip to match you to the antenna. It's amazing. Next. Uh, be using uh, optics to uh, transmit signals on, on your Chips, next. Next. Uh, this is interesting here. In a chip which is uh, 14 nanometer, one square centimeter has 10,000 meters of wire, copper wire, on a chip this big. 10 kilometers on a chip that big. And the wires are so thin 
that they sometimes splatter out the atoms and they leave an opening. And they solve that by using graphene trenches. Next. It's amazing. Eli, we need to finish. How much? Do you have, do you have much more to talk? We, Not too much. How much? Uh, well, we are supposed to be ending right about now. Oh, OK. Uh, your brain uh, weighs only two to three pounds and requires 20 watts. But uh, to do that with uh, today's hardware, require next. Uh, we require a, a city the size of a, a small city like mm -hmm. Boston. Uh, but the possibility for the future is using graphene and uh, quantum computer. Next. 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 Next, and synaptic transistors, next, next, members, next, 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 and spintronics, next, uh, next, 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 we'll skip this, keep going, next, next, how much do you have left? Anytime we should. Get a hundred slides, you know. Still the bill. Oh, we have to come back. Come back. <laughs> what? Come back again. Oh, okay. That's a good idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. About everything today, huh? These are my favorite travel yeah. slides. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can stop that last one. Uh, one back. She asked me for directions in Stockholm. I couldn't help her, but I got her picture. Did <laughs> uh, you get Next. her phone number? <laughs> Next. Uh, they put a raise under your skin to detect if you uh, need insulin or chemotherapy. Next. Uh, they do replacements of hearts and kidneys. Next. This is local. This is a vast gym. And they uh, She heard a woman, a young girl with leukemia recently. She's in reset, remission for six years. Next. You can get a robot that dances and talks to you for $180. Uh, using uh, 3D printing for uh, airplanes. Next. 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 Mm -hmm. These are some of the topics I can talk about in the future. Um, mm -hmm. We can go back. Uh, we'll go back. Okay, we've got about 50 slides to go. Oh, that's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, maybe these are the ones that are important. Go, go to the beginning, uh, the, these lists. Mm -hmm. I can cover uh, uh, one back. One more back. One more. Yeah, MIMO, that's the hottest topic in phase arrays these days. Next. Uh, Night of materials allows invisible man. Uh, synthetic aperture radar. Uh, inverse synthetic aperture radar. Next. Foliage penetration. Varied minds. Next. Over the horizon radar. Whoops, where did he go? Uh, yeah, 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 Einstein says that E equals H F. That's one of his front. No, that's his quantum part. Uh, next, uh, he uh, his work led led to the laser pointer, laser reader, a CD player, and laser communication. Next, and eventually laser computing, uh, quantum computing, and quantum communication, and cryptographics. Next, it talks about quantum radars, but I don't. It uh, probably won't happen. Next, next, uh, e equals mc squared. That's another one of his important equations. Next, you have to know uh, Ohm, Ohm's law. E equals ir. Next, the radar equation. Right. Next, uh, Maxwell's equations. 
Now you know radar. <laughs> Here's the references if you want any of those papers I can send them to you. Next. These also. Uh, next. And we have a conference. Uh, I'll give you a talk on uh, cognitive radar and uh, uh, MIMO for automobiles. Yeah, uh, at the conference. Oh, also tutorial. I'll leave a four hour tutorial there. Next. Uh, these are my books. Next. Next. Uh, courses I give. Next. One of the other courses. Yeah. Can we wrap up now? Because I think really need to. Uh, yeah, this is it. Yeah, yeah, I just I can fast forward through. This is it. This is the last. That, that, that one. You wanted that last one? Yeah.